The lecture we are about to hear from Professor Wendy Pullen is part of the William Thomas Christie Walker Lecture Series, which traditionally has been dedicated to um, ancient and early modern architecture. <coughs> in honor of Walker's architectural scholarship. He was a Scottish um, architectural historian and he was also an alumnus at the, at the BSR. Um, this has recently been opened up to urban studies and the contemporary, a new path, which we're delighted to inaugurate this evening with um, Wendy Pullen, who is professor of architecture um, and urban studies at Cambridge, where she's a fellow at Clare College. Uh, she's also the, the director of the Centre for Urban Conflicts Research at the University of Cambridge. Professor Bullen has published widely on European and Middle Eastern architecture and cities, examining the processes of urban heritage, conflict and change from historical and contemporary perspectives. Recent publications include Locating Urban Conflicts from 2013, and that same year, The Struggle for Jerusalem's Holy Places, and then this year, Violent Infrastructures, Places of Conflict. Um, and currently, Wendy Pullen is writing Urban Agonistes on the Nature of Urban Conflict, which, uh, as I've understood, justice as everyday life, urban conflict and civic space may feed into. So please help me welcome Wendy Pullen this evening. All right, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Um, and I mean, I have to say my, my own work doesn't focus on Italy, um, but I have many colleagues who do work on Italy um, who have told me uh, fantastic things about the British school and so it's absolutely wonderful to be here finally and, uh, and experience the hospitality. My, myself, so thank you very much. Um, now, I think I'd like to begin by saying that, that um, we are overwhelmed by people in the world today crying for justice um, and, and at the same time complaining about injustice. Now, this may have to do um, partly with the, the extreme rise in identity politics, uh, with the, the issues to do with inequality. I mean, there, there can be many reasons behind this, but it's, some, but it's something that we're hearing more and more of. Um, and much of this is, is located in cities, um, to the point that we're constantly hearing about just cities or unjust cities. Um, exactly why justice is located in cities is, is, is um, I think, a very problematic um, question, and this is what I want to focus on with my lecture this, this evening. Uh, if we, certainly, if we look at court systems, we find that they tend to be state-dominated or sometimes regional or very local with magistrates, but the idea of a, of a modern city court system is, 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 is not something that we experience in most places. So that there, there, there isn't an obvious connection between the two. And that may, in some ways, lead to the sentiment that is, is expressed right here. Uh, this is a wish tree in front of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And whoever wrote this here is saying, well, justice is not real. And I think this is quite typical of the way many people approach justice. They want it but it is not something that they can grasp in, in any tangible sort of way. So it's a very, very problematic concept. Now, if we look at The Hague, I mean, this is in some ways where, where I started, and it, it seemed like an obvious place. If you want to look for justice in cities, why not start in The Hague, where the International um, Court of Justice is? Now, this, this, is, this is very interesting, because what we find, if you go into their visitor center, there is this map, and um, there's actually six large court, courts in The Hague, uh, located in, in, in different places, and together they form a type of topography of justice in the city. So it's a very, very explicit attempt to, to try and embody justice in a city. Um, 
the Hague itself is often used as a, as, as kind of a, um, a short uh, way of referring to international justice, and we talk about going to the Hague. So certainly the attempt to, to equate the city with justice systems it comes out very, very strongly um, in, in, in the Hague. Um, and so the, the Hague is seen in a lot of ways as an arbiter for really for the whole world. Um, but for most it's powerful, but also very, very obscure. Um, and it's, it's a very kind of top-down system. It very much embodies um, an, a, authority. Now, in The Hague, one of the interesting things is how many um, smaller bodies, mostly NGOs, that have been spawned by the courts of justice. And if you walk around the city, you find many, many examples um, of, uh, of these, these smaller organizations. And it can be anything from this Dutch-Turkish Center for Public Debate to this, I'm not sure if you can actually read what is carved into the stone there, but, it's, but this is an NGO called Passage to Democracy, which I found quite astounding that, that anybody would name themselves that and carve it into the stone over their doorway. But in any case, this, this pr pr proliferation of institutions probably does encourage participation and wider understanding, at least in The Hague. However, it is very difficult to imagine how this could possibly be rec replicated in other cities. Um, and certainly the feeling that I have there is that justice is being laid down on top of the city rather than coming from within. So certainly in terms of the questions that I was trying to pose for myself, it didn't really answer very many, as interesting as it was. Um, the, the literature, often refers to cities and, and justice. Um, certainly Henri Lefebvre's The Right to the City or David Harvey's Social Justice in the City are, 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 are very, very carefully read, important books. They, they both uh, follow along uh, John Rawls' theories of justice. He doesn't um, talk directly about um, cities, but it's, it's, it's kind of hanging there in the background. And this has spawned a whole other um, genre of literature that's closely related, which focuses mostly on social justice. So some of the, these are um, authors here that, that, that you may have, have come across. Um, these are all important books, and I'm not trying to be disparaging in any sort of way for the, the kind of work that, that, that has been done. But in focusing primarily on social justice, the issues are mainly about whether people have rights, whether they have good housing, whether they have a sense of dignity, whether they have good health care, this sort of thing. Um, but none of them really try to link the concept of justice with the city itself. And so I think there's gaps in the thinking. Um, and and there's, there, there's several uh, that, that I've listed here. First of all, I think, is, is how, how really is justice oriented towards the urban, as opposed to, to say, the state or the communal, or even the tribal? Um, you know, why is justice urban? How have our attitudes towards justice changed over time? I mean, there's very, very little work that has been done historically that also forms part of, of, of the discourse that I'm talking about. Um, I'm an architect, I, I work in spatial concerns, and so the whole question of whether physical spaces in the city can somehow embody an, um, justice, um, you know, does that happen? And if so, how does that happen? Again, this is, this is a, a gap in our thinking. And finally, and closely related to that, ha it has to do with representation. How can justice be made visible and recognizable to ordinary people in cities? And, and we don't understand that very well either. Um, I've actually found for my work, um, Paul Ricoeur, so coming from a philosophical point of view, a book that he wrote in 1995 on, on the just. And he starts very simply. I mean, he says simply, justice is an integral part of the wish to live well. And he reminds us that, that um, Aristotle saw uh, justice in the context of the city. Um, Hannah Arendt, who is always very useful in these, in these um, uh, sorts of questions, 
um, and somebody that Ricoeur also uh, quotes, and, and she says, it is as citizens that we become human. The wish to live with unjust institutions signifies nothing else. So there's a very, very strong communal sense. Um, it's, we're looking at a very broad reading of justice here, but clearly these people are saying that it has to do with public life and public institutions, that it doesn't really focus that much on individuals and individual rights. And that, that's, that's very, very different than a lot of, of the, the literature that we find today. So um, we can begin with this idea that a prime locus for public life is, is in the city. But this is problematic, and it's problematic because there is a basic paradox between justice and judicial systems and the city. And to put it very, very simply, is that justice itself is a very abstract sort of idea, and most legal systems are also extremely abstract. They're hard for people to grasp and, and understand um, at that, that level of, of conception and of abstractness. Um, the city, on the other hand, is extremely tangible. You know, we live in cities, we understand cities as, as, as something that we participate in and that has a very tangible aspect to it. Um, so that we find that most injustices for, for ordinary people take place in everyday situations in cities. Um, but they're seen to be righted by legal systems um, and so people go off to court. I mean, this is how you write a situation, or you at least attempt, attempt to do that. Um, and in doing so, we step away from, from the everyday. We step away into a system that is foreign to us and, and, as I say, quite abstract. And I think one of the things that's very telling about this is you go into most cities today and ask people, particularly young people, where is the courthouse? They won't know where that is. Um, compared to say, in the 19th century when the courthouse was a major civic building that marked the center of the city, today courthouses are generally speaking not terribly well known. Obviously you ask somebody you know, where's the local shopping mall, that they'll, they'll know immediately. But the courthouse is something that, that is really quite foreign to most people. So in this particular situation, you know, I, I mean I found myself uh, re reaching a dead end rather quickly because of this sort of disjuncture. However, it came up against the, um, quite an ancient concept, um, the idea of nomos. And nomos, of course, is, is ancient Greek that is usually translated as law, but it actually has two meanings. One is, is, is simply, as one would expect, law as a system of rules to be observed. And that's the way it's normally used. However, the second meaning of nomos, and this is the one that's very interesting for me, is that this is law as convention. Sometimes it's, it's used to explain customary law, um, but certainly it has to do with customary practices and ultimately culture itself. Now that's the second meaning for nomos. I will come back to it in various sorts of ways, but I think it's very important. Um, I did look into um, a certain amount of legal theory and jurisprudence. Um, there's not a huge amount of interest in, in everyday life and law, I will say. However, I did come across Robert Cover, uh, who was an, an American um, law professor in Harvard in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, he was being tipped as, as, as somebody who would be right for the American Supreme Court. Uh, unfortunately, he died at an early age, so he, he never got to the Supreme Court. But he wrote a very, very interesting, um, long um, ar article and, and judgment on the relationship between um, uh, legal theory and nomos. And what he said is in the normative world, and the normative world is his translation of nomos, he says in the normative world, law and narrative are inseparably related. So legal systems and narrative, which he's taking to be the stories that we tell about ourselves in our lives, he's saying those two go together. So this, this was very, very interesting coming from a legal expert uh, rather than somebody who would normally be working on everyday life. And all right, I think 
I think the one thing I'd like to say at this point, the very fact that I've had to give you three long slides just of writing in order to explain what the problem is, is part of the problem. Um, the, very, the fact that um, there, there is this disjuncture that we don't even recognize, but it's very much there, I think is part of the problem. And so just to begin to explain it, we need all of this explanation. However, I'm gonna to move to something that certainly looks much nicer and I, and I hope in some ways will be more palatable for you. Um, I think it was, it was important to go back into historical examples here because actually what we find in pre-modern times, in some ways there is more interest and more um, examples of, of the relationship between everyday life and cities and um, justice and political systems. And it becomes rolled into one in a very, very good example, which is, is in Siena. I'm assuming that a number of people in the room will know Siena, um, but for those of you who don't, uh, the Palazzo Publico, right in, in the center of, of historic Siena, has a room called the Sala dei Nove, so the room of the, of the nine. And this was the room where the nine governors of the city came together to debate the city, to, to make laws, to deal with problems and so on. These were the governors of the city. And they sat in a room that is a painted room covered in murals um, and the two dominant murals, one on, on the east wall, one on the west wall, show on one side the good city representations of justice in, in medieval city, in Siena. Interestingly, I think that, that the idea of the good city and the just city are, are pretty much equated um, in, in, this, in this sort of thinking. And what we find um, is, a, is a city represented, it's recognizable as medieval Siena. People look pretty happy. I mean, they're actually dancing in the streets. The buildings are in very good repair you go out into the countryside and it's very, very well tended. Um, the trees are all growing beautifully, there's crops in the field and so on. And, and with the implication that the good city results from good governance and justice. Now on the other side of the room is the bad city or the unjust city. And in, in, this, in this particular city, and unfortunately here the, the mural is, is quite badly damaged, but we can still see quite well the buildings are falling to pieces. I think there's some trees growing out of the roofs of some of them. People are dying in the streets. Um, and when we go out into the countryside, that, that critical connection to the countryside shows a countryside that's been burned, the crops are not growing, and there's very poor an animal husbandry that, that is going on there. Um, so, all right, we have these two extremes on either side, but you have to remember that you have these nine governors sitting in this room and surrounded by these, these murals. Now, it gets, I think, more interesting if we look at the, the urban topography of Siena, because what we find here is the Palazzo Publico, which is this building right here. On one side, it looks into the city and this wonderful shell-shaped piazza, which we see right here, and that's the Palazzo Publico. And in the center here, the, here's the Sala de Nove. And then on the other side here, and you can actually see that view, I took that photograph from a window in this room in the Sala de Nove, you look out into the countryside. So what Lorenzetti was painting is actually the situation that he was in inside this room. I mean, it's, it's as if a section was taken through there and that's what he was painting. Now, so that all of these frescoes would be recognizable to the citizens of, of Siena. And the piazza, of course, is a, is a public place that is open to all of the, uh, of, of, of the citizens. But effectively, this building, and particularly that room, gives an ethical orientation to the piazza and to the countryside beyond. It links it and it's recognizable and it's visible. So some of the questions that I was asking earlier when I started the lecture are being answered here historically 
in this particular situation. And so if we look at the legal situation of medieval cities, we will find that, that they are what is often referred to as de facto corporations. Um, that people were citizens of cities or city-states, um, particularly in Italian city-states, but um, in, in a number of different locations across Europe. Um, and that justice and citizen, citizenship related directly to what people do. And that happened through guilds, it happened through trusts and so on, but it was very, very much tied into what people do in the cities. That praxis was the key to understanding the de, de facto corporations. Um, we had a very direct representation of, um, uh, of this sort of situation, of, of this kind of praxis that was happening through the art and the architecture, but also through rituals, commerce, fellowship, institutions, all of the major aspects that would have concerned people as citizens in, in Siena. Um, and I think we can say then that ci the citizens were collectively the city and they identified with its physical topography as well as all of the elements in that. They were very much tied to the world they were, that they were living in. And so that this idea of the normative world or nomos really existed in the cultures and conventions of, of, um, of city life in a medieval town like this. Now, if we move to early modern cities, the term changes, and they're referred to as de jure corporations rather than de facto corporations. And what we find is that, that with these de jure co corporations, um, that they are created mostly by ro royal law. So this is no longer coming from the citizens of the city, this is actually coming from the, the, from, from the rulers. Now the citizens are, are, are individuals, they're seen as individuals in the city, and they're seen as people with certain rights and certain obligations, and it would depend on who you were and what your status and what your rights were, but nonetheless, um, there, there was a, uh, the beginning of a sense of the individual, um, but the, and their, their rights and obligations emerged from the state. Uh, at first the royal state, and after that with the development of the nation state, this, this, this continued. And, and this is a very different situation than, than their rights and obligations arising from civic institutions. Engen Issen speaks a lot of that in, in, uh, in his book, Being Political. And um, I mean, it's quite a long and involved story, this, this transition. But we see it very, very clearly in a lot of the institutions that develop. I mean, I've, I've made a list here of uh, the, of the, the different ways that they, they approach this in, in treatises, theories, edicts, proclamations, and so on. Um, but probably nowhere more so than in the idea of the ideal city, which became absolutely popular um, in, in the 16th century. And I think this is because there is an increasing idea of the town as an idea rather than a place in, in, in which you participate in, or perhaps at this point, in addition to the place in which you participate in. And so the, the, the idea of summarizing a town as an ideal city like we see in, in these, I mean, these are almost diagrammatic plans. I mean, certainly Filarete right here. Uh, it spreads into other parts of Europe, like we see in Mannheim, or, or in this case, this, this, this city is actually um, built. But they're very, very um, geometrized and, 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 and abstracted cities to represent this, this fantastic idea, really. Um, and with that, we find that cities become more distant from every, everyday activity and, and, and places. And this is a long process that goes on over several hundred years and, and coincides with the development of, of, of the Enlightenment. But certainly, the, the, ide the ideal town is something that um, is very representative of the, of the beginning of this. Um, and what's interesting, I think, is that this conception of a town as a de jure corporation is basically how we understand our cities today. 
And this, we, we still live with this. Um, there is, is this primary understanding of nomos as, as law, as legality, or norm, and this is the, the first understanding of nomos, and these become the prerogative of state laws, and then this is passed down to us into cities from the state, and this supersedes the everyday life of cities. Um, James C. C. Scott tells us a lot about that. And um, I think, I, I can't possibly go into it at this point, but I think it is probably worth saying that, um, these, that although urban histories vary tremendously for different non-European cities, um, but most cities, certainly many cities, and I would probably go as far to say as most cities, are still basically informed by this idea of a de jure cor corporation for cities. And so interesting, when you look at, at um, this example of, a, of, of an ideal city plan by the Venetians for Nicosia in Cyprus, and today when we look at the two city seals, and Cyprus is a divided city, so we have, we have the Greek Cypriot seal here and the Turkish Cypriot seal there, but you can see they are still using that, that basic form of the ideal city in order to describe that, or at least symbolize their situation. And so my question then is, you know, I mean, well, what's happened to the second meaning of nomos, this idea of culture and, and convention? Can we still find that in, in, in cities? Um, so I would say, yeah, actually we can. It's, it's, a it's a little bit stifled at this point in a lot of ways, but I think, I, I think we actually can find it. And that comes out of participation. And I think we have to look at the relationship between nomos and urban space in order to, to understand that well. That first of all, um, we have to remember that urban space is understood from its own experience. It's understood through participation. That if you have a picture of a town as an ideal city, like we're looking at right there, it's very interesting. There's a lot we can say from about it. But you have no conception of urban space in that particular picture right there, or very, very little conception. That the way we understand urban space is by walking through it or even by driving through it, but it is by participating in that space. Um, and so that, that, that in that we have the second understanding of nomos, I think that's brought back to us and we can put that together with the two sides of nomos and space. The first one, that the territory of political systems um, is, is, is realized through legality, sovereignty, and state building. And the second one, that the spatial qualities and the activities in them make possible everyday life and customary activities. So again, they're very, they're very, very different depending on two different conceptions of space. Um, that causes all sorts of problems, and I would argue that a lot of the conflicts that we have in cities today have, um, are realized spatially through the difference between certain understandings that are passed down to us by systems coming from the nation state, and on the other hand, by the way, people participate in urban life in cities, in what we would call everyday life. And so that this, this, this sense of participative space can contradict with the more abstract senses of space. And states and cities are really not necessarily compatible. And we see that in two, in two illustrations right here. This is in Jerusalem, or just on the edge of Jerusalem. It's actually in it's the Bethlehem checkpoint, which is, is just outside of Jerusalem. All right, so here we have the wall the separation barrier that has been established by the State of Israel, um, um, very, very much a state institution. We, this is a warring situation. There, there are extreme levels of conflict in this part of the world. Um, and on this, the Bethlehem side, we see the Palestinians trying to make sense of their own lives there. And there is, I think, what we can call participative space. They're living in that space. 
So there is a major taxi rank at this point as you come through the checkpoint. It's quite chaotic. Um, there's a certain amount of resistance that's evident right here. There's quite a lot of graffiti on that wall and then painted over by the Israeli authorities right here. And, um, and people have set up uh, little stalls and sort of shops and so on as people come through that they, they can do their shopping. So we have a real conflict, I think, between this huge structure that has been erected by the state authorities and the sort of life that is going on here in, in, in Bethlehem. If we come down to, to this image right here, um, this, is, this is inside Jerusalem. This is, it's inside the old city. Uh, in, in the Muslim quarter, it's a little tiny square. Um, and I think I was lucky enough to be able to snap the photo when I did, um, because what I've got there is an incredible combination of different people. That there are Palestinians here, there, there's even a disabled Palestinian walking along here, there, there's a couple of tourists over there, there's Israeli border police, there are, there's Israeli army, and for good measure, there is a, is a Coptic monk right there. Now, Jerusalem is an extremely damaged city with, with a conflict that has been going on now for over 70 years. But what we're looking at here, that even in a damaged city like that, to, to some extent, people come together in the spaces of the town, that there are aspects of everyday life um, give them the opportunity to participate in the town. And so that despite the contradictions that, that, that we're finding, um, the inca um, incompatibility of states and, and cities, we find that actually that is overcome in many ways by everyday life. Um, and, 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 and it overcomes certain formal legal systems. Now, I want to give you an example, a very, very simple example, to, just to start with, that, that I think um, illustrates it very well, because these situations are potentially infinite in cities. And so that we can begin, again, um, well, I'll begin with two things. First of all, I think just to remind ourselves what is praxis in cities, and Peter Carl's um, comment that a, that a town mostly happens in what people do. So that's the older understanding of, of, of nomos. Um, and this photograph right here. This is in Jerusalem again, um, just up the street from the, the little square I just showed you. And what we've got here are two women um, making a deal over some lettuce. Uh, this woman here is, is selling herbs and lettuce that, that she has, has brought to this busy street. And this woman here is, um, is, is buying the lettuce or attempting to buy the lettuce. Now, if we, um, if we look at the two women, I mean, I can tell this is a village woman because of what she's wearing, and I can tell this is an urban woman because of what she's wearing. But with even less knowledge, you can tell very, very quickly the kind of, of, of transaction that's going on. They'll be talking about the quality of the lettuce, They'll be talking about how much the woman's going to buy, how much she's going to pay for it. Um, is it a good deal? Is it a bad deal? Uh, if, the, if this woman shops here regularly, there may be some very friendly banter that goes on and, and, and this sort of thing. If you look a little bit more closely, what you find is it has a very, very strong spatial aspect to it. That she's located herself well in this busy street in order to sell the lettuce. Um, she is in the street. If you see, there's a line right here. She's kind of in a, in a little niche here where, where the, there's an indentation on the street. But look how carefully she places herself on the public side of that, that border so as not to cause any problem with the private property behind her. Now, all of those things um, are, are aspects that probably any one of you could pick out if you studied this, this photograph a little bit. What you don't know, and what I know, because I've researched it and you haven't, is that there's another level of meaning in all of this. And that is that this woman here is from the West Bank. And according to Israeli law, it is illegal for her to come in and sell in Jerusalem. <laughs> 
You cannot even sell herbs and lettuce in Jerusalem if you're from the West Bank. But she's there, and the way she does it is that she sneaks in at about 3 o'clock in the morning. She gets across the border. She leaves her, her lettuce to somebody else to bring in, and that's, and that's done in a way that um, by Israeli law would be considered legal. Um, but eventually, the woman and her lettuce are reunited here in, in the market, and she's able to make a, li a living. So she's got a lot of people helping her, that transporting the lettuce. All of the, the vendors around her know what the situation is. But m probably most interesting is that the Israeli inspector of the market also knows exactly what's going on, and he simply turns a blind eye to this. So what we're looking at here is actually a much more complex situation than, than you would, would um, normally expect from some, such a simple transaction. Um, but certainly, we're looking at a series of conventions or norms, um, and they're both very, very habitual that we recognize because they are so habitual. And on the other hand, they are changing as the political situation changes as well. Um, and that new, new everyday conventions then are being created through a situation like this. The conventions arise um, from being visible, they're recognizable at least to a point, uh, they're repeated and they're very, very much tied to place. So the conditions that, that I was concerned about, that I felt um, I wasn't being able to, to see through, through most of the, the discourse on urban justice, in a very, very simple way here, are, 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 are evident. Um, and and there, there is, you know, there's a sense that we can begin to pick up how everyday life is, is contri uh, contributing to various levels of meaning but also various levels of justice and injustice. It's very, very much a combination here for this woman. She's working really, really hard in order to, um, to, to, to make a, a living. Um, and of course, situations like this, as I said before, are potentially infinite. All right, so let's go to something that is a little bit more complex at this point. Um, in fact, a lot more complex tonight because I want to um, end the lecture with two examples, uh, one in Beirut and one in Jerusalem. Um, with, and these are, are, rather than just a simple transaction in the street, these are full urban situations, extremely problematic ones, but I think with potential to understand this problem of where justice may exist in cities. So I start with Martyr's Square, or the Burj, as it's known in Arabic in, in Beirut. Um, Beirut of course, had a very long civil war from 1975 to 90, and it was divided. And you can probably just see that green line right there. Is it West Beirut, which was, was Sunni Muslim, um, mostly, and East Beirut, that was mostly Christian here. The center or downtown area, which is this gray area right here, um, was, was, was uh, almost completely destroyed. And Martyr's Square, which we see in the 1960s up here, um, was really the center of the town. I mean, that, that's where you went to meet people, and, and it was understood very much as the center. And it was right in this area right there. If we look at the map of the downtown, here is, the, is Martyr's Square, and this is how the downtown looked before the Civil War. Um, and, and that whole area corresponds roughly to that gray area right there. Today, people have very romantic, very nostalgic our, our memories of cosmopolitan Beirut, and many of them focus around Martyrs, Martyrs Square. Um, but in the Civil War, very, very bad damage, which we can see from that slide, and today, this is what Martyrs Square looks like. I mean, basically, there is nothing there except a, a statue that we see here to the, to the martyrs, and that has been left and repaired and so on. But other than that, there is nothing in that square. Mind you, the whole the area, this gray area, has been mostly rebuilt. And we have the problem here with this, the, the square. Um, I think people, the Beirutis believe that the square cannot be left to one community. 
but the city is not sufficiently integrated in order that many communities can work on it together in order to, to, to somehow agree a way of, of rebuilding it. So it remains, it remains a real thorn in the side of, of the people in the city and very, very problematic. Uh, we see even today, um, 2000, and I think I took those probably in about 2016, but, but, but um, Civil War ended in 1990, so we're looking at a long time since the Civil War. But we, see, we still see the trauma of war um, with all of the, the security and so on, um, but we also see the trauma of redevelopment in this, in this city. Um, that there's been a very, very strong combination of war and neoliberalism, um, and that has meant that there's been very, very little um, a, a possibility for ordinary citizens to participate in decision making um, uh, or, 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 or any other sort of meaningful activity in the rebuilding of Beirut. The, um, the area that, uh, or the name that, that is used to refer to this area of rebuilding is called Solidaire, and it's talked about as a forgetful landscape. Um, one that privileges only some of the people. The design um, is based on exclusion. I mean, I was astounded by this, that all the people and all the things that you cannot do in the Solidaire area. Um, an attempt to bring together Muslims and Christians right there, they don't do it terribly well. And that's because the design is based primarily on finance and security as, as well of, as um, uh, secure, uh, as exclusion. And so you can see why the Beirutis are, are so afraid of making the same sorts of mistakes again with Martyr Square, which is a place that they, they really truly love. Um, and so we have a situation where it is simply too precious to touch. And that's really how it looks at this point, except that some people are touching. And they're doing it in a very ad hoc kind of way. They're, they're, um, they're, there's a lot of political activism that goes on in this city. Uh, and we see them establishing new conventions in Martyr Square. Um, there are regularly demonstrations held there, um, certain activities uh, like collecting aid for Syrian refugees. A quarter of the country now is, uh, is made up of Syrian refugees. That's a major issue right there. Um, somebody like Samir Khalaf, who is a, his, a sociologist who's worked on Beirut, and, and he calls the Martyr Square a testing ground for collective mobilization. Um, in one of the people that I interviewed in, in recent research there, he said Martyr Square is the place where the Lebanese learn to stand up for themselves. Now, I think one of the mo most interesting and, and somewhat amusing um, activities, the, the, the Beirutis standing up for themselves, was um, a protest called You Stink. Now, um, and uh, I mean, you may recognize some of these problems here, that, that um, um, the, this was a very large nonpartisan protest against corrupt and efficient politicians. And one of the big problems in Beirut is that there hasn't been a good enough government and a government without corruption um, to collect the rubbish. And the rubbish has been sitting in the streets for, it, it, it's going on to about three or four years at this point. And the city does smell a little bit, um, depending on the weather. Um, there was a decision made not to use party political flags or banners, and this is in a highly politicized city. Um, but but the, the protest was organized by uh, public uh, bodies uh, rather than, than political parties. And it, was local, and, it, and it was organized very, very much on a local um, sort of level. And, and it was important for them to locate this on the old green line, the place of division between the city. They said this, it was very important that they located it there because this was the place where they could bring people together again symbolically, um, demanding some very simple things, but the basic conventions of urban life really in the face of neglect and corruption. Um, and 
the protest was very, very much rooted in praxis. So it was very much to do with everyday life. I mean, what could be more every day than, than collecting the rubbish out of, uh, of the streets? And, and this was in order to make their demands known. Now, if we move to Jerusalem, and a second example here, uh, we have the area of Damascus Gate. And uh, Damascus Gate was, was um, a very, very beautiful Ottoman structure, the most important gate in the, um, in the old city of Jerusalem. There is the old city right there on that map. And again, we're looking at a border situation. So this green line was the, the border between um, the Jewish side of the city and the Arab side of the city between 1948 and 1967. And it is still an extremely divided city. So this gate and the area in front of it, which we are looking at, we're looking at it here, and, and this is quite an analytical map that we did, um, or this aerial photograph, it's at an absolutely key point, very much like this, the Martyr's Square in Beirut. That's the old city wall right there. The gate is right at that position, and sorry, right there at that position. This is the old city, and you can tell by the historical fabric. This is the new city. Um, this has, has been pretty much leveled by war damage. Israeli side is here, Palestinian side is there. So that triangle of land is, is absolutely key right here. Now this is completely controlled by Israel. The Palestinians have very, very little say in what happens here. It's a highly politicized place and it represents the division of the city. Um, it, there's a very, very heavy police and military control there, which um, I mean, you get the idea, I think, from some of these slides. Plus, um, th there was the decision to put an inner city motorway into the middle of that triangle. So uh, that's Israeli, that's Palestinian, and if there's anything that divides a city um, uh, more effectively, it's, it's a big, fast road. I mean, I would say more than a wall, a road divides a, a, a city. So that division is very, very powerful in that particular place. Um, but for the Israelis, um, despite the fact that very little has been done to improve this area, um, that it's, it's, it's very valuable territory. But most of the people who inhabit it are Palestinians, and you can see them being checked by the police as they're going into, into the gateway right over there. So very little attempt done, made to reconcile the two sides. Um, but what we find, uh, as I said, this is a Palestinian area, and what we find is that the Palestinians are doing certain things that they've simply taken on their own account to try and combat this situation in the Damascus Gate area that at a certain point, the Israelis did try and improve it. They, they built an amphitheater in here. Um, for the Palestinians, well, they didn't like it because the Israelis built it, and the Palestinians won't use anything that the Israelis build. However, it was also too much of a panopticon for them to, to use it in the way that it was intended, because normally, in this little window up here, you have a soldier sitting there watching. So, I mean, a really strong sense of being a panopticon. But what has happened over time is that we find this kind of influx of everyday life in the form of, the, of a market. And the Palestinians, I think very logically, figured there's markets just inside the gate and there's markets beyond the gate, so in this direction. So why not have another market here that links up the whole thing? It makes a lot of sense at an urban level. People sh they shop all the way into the gate and all the way out again. And it's a very peculiar market in the middle of an amphitheater, but this is what they've got there. And it is kind of to tolerated by the Israelis. Um, the Israeli authorities will not tolerate any political action on the point um, on behalf of the Palestinians. However, they will tolerate commercial action. So this effectively is commercial space invented by the Palestinians as part of their everyday life in order to subvert the political situation 
that they that they they find themselves in the city, and so there is this this kind of shift in in power relationships that we see in the city, um, and and so that we have a non-political commercial resistance, I would say, in this gateway. Um, the story. It's an ongoing story. I'm not sure that it's going to have a happy ending. Um, the is Israeli authorities are retaliating at this point, I mean, almost as we speak, to some extent, because they're erecting um, army checkpoints, and which we see right there. This is just in front of the gate, and there it is over there. Um, so that they're, they're, they're kind of fighting the micro moves of the Palestinians with micro moves um, of, of their own. And this may have wa wider ramifications. I can't say at this point, because as I say, it is, it's, it's happening now, this year. Um, but what we're looking at, I think, are microplays of everyday justice and, in and injustice once again. Okay, so we, what we've got then are these two examples that are in flux at this point. They don't, there, there aren't ends to the stories yet. They're very, very much happening, uh, I mean, pretty much as, as we speak. In some ways they're similar and in some ways they're different. I think in Martin Square, um, in Martyr's Square, we can see that the efforts to create the political space of justice through everyday demonstration in the face of overriding liberal development. So they're using politics in order to fight against the, 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 the heavy economic development. In Jerusalem, on the other hand, it's a very creative use of everyday space to establish rights through ad hoc commerce rather than politics. So the Palestinians are doing just the opposite. They are, uh, they're not allowed to use politics, so they're using commercial activity to resist where they cannot use um, uh, uh, political activity. In both of them, uh, they reflect, I think, work that was done by Asef Bayat, who, who looked at the political street mostly in Tehran, but he saw it as signifying the collective sensibilities, shared feelings, and public judgment of ordinary people in their day-to-day -day utterances and, and pra practices. That, I mean, he, in, in Tehran, has found very, very direct links between political activity and how people live their everyday lives. I think this is what we're seeing in Jerusalem and in, in Beirut. Um, what we're seeing is an establishment of both very old and, and, and actually very new conventions of everyday life, from this second meaning of nomos. And it's happening through demonstrations and markets and charity and, and so on. Um, in both cities, they're capitalizing on the former dividing lines of their respective cities, um, but both are very, very fragile situations. In both cities, everything could, could blow up, you know, a few wrong moves and, and the whole thing could, could blow up. So, so um, uh, the injustices are certainly there, but, they're, they're, but, but the, the work is going on to try and create justices out of the injustices and we'll have to see what happens. So if I can just conclude then with a, with, with a few comments right here on, on everything that I've tried to say this afternoon. Um, I think that the, the protocols in which everyday justice operates can be explained by nomos as, as law by cultural convention. I think that's a very useful idea. Um, it's, a, it's an ancient idea and it's probably something that we should be reviving and using more th than, than we do. Um, I think in urban life, what we can call the habitual and the hybrid take on real significance and justice is absolutely mixed. I think it's wrong to see rights simply as you have the rights or you don't have them. That's not how it works in cities. Sometimes you have more rights than other times. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, you have to claim back some sort of rights, some level of justice. And so that we have, for example, this, this was um, a discussion group that I was at fairly recently on John Rawls. Um, and the comment was made that there is no moment of justice, it is a series of compromises. 
Uh, I think that's echoed by Boltonsky and Thevenot and their, their very, very interesting work on, on cities where they say cities are not ideal types of shared evaluations, but rather forms of argumentation in situations of agreement and disagreement. Um, certainly in, in the research that's come out of our, our own research center in Cambridge, uh, what we've found that when the official political situations begin to unravel, um, which is what you get when in cases of extreme conflict in cities, that actually the practices of everyday life start to kick in. And that's usually what saves the populations as much as they, as they can be um, saved. And there, there's, there, if there's any sustenance of the public order, it usually comes from the practices of everyday life. Um, I think that, that the participation in everyday civic activities is critical. Um, that whole long explanation on de facto cities and, and de jure cities was all about that. We need to be able to participate in our cities. Um, and in order to do that, the physical spaces for participation need to be there. We find in cities that experience very high levels of conflict, the first thing municipal authorities do is close down the public spaces. And you can understand why. If people are killing each other, what they want to do is separate the people and get them out of the public spaces. Public spaces are too difficult to control and, and um, security is really hard to maintain in a public space. But by destroying the public spaces, in the long term, it makes it much more difficult to bring, bring back people to participate in the city, and that's a really serious problem. Once you destroy a public space, it's very difficult to put it back to, to, together again. Um, and so I think that what I probably would, would then close with is just this last point here, that um, I mean, our, we have potentially infinite experience of nomos because we live it all the time. I mean, this is just, you know, this is how we are. Um, and if we're interested in cities, we have to look at that much more carefully because we can actually build upon it um, as a m much better understanding of how everyday life in, in, in cities works and how we might be able to make better cities that are more just and, uh, and more participative. So thank you very much.